Under fire, the Prime Minister is accused of covering up a Trident missile test that reportedly went wrong. Missile away. Theresa May insists she has absolute confidence in the system, but she won't say if she knew the unarmed missile had suffered a malfunction. I'm regularly briefed on national security issues. I was briefed on the successful certification of HMS Vengeance and her crew. We don't comment on the operational details for national security reasons. In the Commons, the Defence Secretary faces calls for more clarity. Also tonight, Trump gets down to business. Trade and security top the President's to-do list. Five days on, those searching for survivors at the Italian Avalanche Hotel find a small sign of hope. And... Hello, hello. This is Nighthawk receiving you loud and crackly. Farewell to Gordon Kay, star of the 80s sitcom Hello, Hello. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. The Prime Minister and her Defence Secretary were accused today of deliberately covering up a failed missile test from a Trident submarine. MPs say Theresa May and Sir Michael Fallon withheld the information from the House of Commons as members were voting on renewing the nuclear deterrent. Mrs May finally admitted today that she had been briefed about the test but insists she had absolute faith in Trident. Our political correspondent Carl Dinnan has more. Trident nuclear missiles are Britain's last line of defence, but today the Prime Minister was having to defend them, following reports that a test missile had failed just weeks before she asked Parliament to renew the system. We don't comment on the operational details for national security reasons, but the key issue about the debate that we had in the House of Commons on future Trident was whether we should renew Trident for the future. Should we continue to have an independent nuclear deterrent? I have absolute faith in our independent nuclear deterrent. In June, the unarmed missile was launched from HMS Vengeance. The normal test route would be from the coast of Florida towards the coast of West Africa. But at some point, this missile is ported to have malfunctioned. Today, a US source confirmed the missile was then ordered to self-destruct. Should people regard Britain's nuclear deterrent as reliable? Britain's nuclear deterrent is thoroughly reliable. It's probably the best system in the world, the Trident system, uh, with the D-5 missile. Um, it, it, we've, even, though, even though one of them clearly went awry. Yes, we, we've done we've done well over 100 firings altogether of these missiles. Dive the submarine. The government insists it doesn't comment on operational details, but it has publicly announced successful tests and even released this video of the last one. Missile away. Last is receiving telemetry. But some MPs are angry because although the test took place three days before the EU referendum in June and Mrs May was told about it when she became Prime Minister in July, she then advocated renewal of the submarines in the House of Commons without mentioning the problem. So today the Defence Secretary was ordered into Parliament to answer MPs' questions. Why was this information deliberately kept from Parliament and the British public? Could he also tell the House when he was first informed that there was a problem with the test? Was it he who informed the new Prime Minister about the failure? We do not comment on the detail of submarine operations. I can assure the House that the capability and effectiveness of the United Kingdom's independent nuclear deterrent is not in doubt. The only detail the government would confirm is that the submarine and crew in question were certified as having passed their test in June. They have not denied there was a problem with the missile. Now, Carl, these questions about what the government did or, or, or didn't know about the Trident test are not going away, are they? No, they're certainly not. The chairman of the Defence Committee here in the Commons today said that he wanted uh, Michael Fallon to come and talk to his committee tomorrow in closed session if needs be. Now, as far as what did go wrong, piecing together sources and people I've spoken to, it seems that after this missile was launched, the submarine basically lost contact with it. The telemetry failed. What's called the telemetry meaning the submarine didn't know where the missile was or what it was doing. At that point, it ordered it uh, to 
to, to self-destruct and it veered off course then as it's supposed to and crashed into the sea. So uh, really that, that safety system uh, succeeded. It did what it was supposed to do. But as far as things go here are concerned, so long as MPs think the wool has been pulled over their eyes, they'll keep going at it. OK, Carl Dinan in Westminster, thank you. President Trump today signed his first executive order of his first working week, scrapping plans for a huge trade deal across the Pacific. He said he'd done a great thing for American workers. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore reports on the new president getting down to business. On his first working day in the Oval Office, and Donald Trump confirmed himself to be America's protectionist in chief. Withdrawal uh, from the United, of the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This executive order terminates a free trade deal with Pacific nations. Everyone knows what that means, right? We've been talking about this for a long time. Thank you. Okay. The president will also soon abandon the North American trade deal, a move that will end the flow of goods tariff-free between the US, Canada and Mexico. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Earlier today, the president was meeting with some of America's most prominent business leaders, at times extolling his own virtues. I'm a very a big person when it comes to the environment. I've received awards on the envir environment. But while also warning of the consequences of defying him and moving jobs or factories overseas. We are going to be imposing a very major border tax on the product when it comes in, which I think is fair, which is fair. So a company that wants to fire all of its people in the United States and build some factory someplace else and then thinks that that product is going to just flow across the border into the United States, that's not going to happen. Thousands of people from it moves the agenda back to trade after the White House appeared obsessed over the weekend with the size of the inauguration crowds. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. By telling a number of clear falsehoods from this podium, the White House now faces a serious credibility problem. What can we believe on other, more significant matters? Please rise. And the administration is continuing to be buffeted by leaks and rumors. I state your full name. According to reports, the new National Security Advisor, General Mike Flynn, here being sworn in yesterday, is being investigated by counterintelligence agencies over links with Russia. Thank you very much. The president is now ushering in an entirely new era, attacking the very foundations of free trade and globalization. And report, uh, Robert, we're getting reports tonight of military cooperation between the Russians and the Americans. What can you tell us? Well, in all honesty, a lot of confusion uh, tonight. Yes, the Russian Defence Ministry are reporting that there has been a joint Russian-US uh, military operation against an ISIS target in Syria. Clearly, that would be a remarkable uh, improvement in military cooperation. But the Pentagon here tonight is denying it, calling that report uh, rubbish. I mean, whoever we believe, uh, whatever uh, is right, it does raise two really intriguing questions about the Trump uh, presidency. Firstly, you know, what will be the new strategy against uh, the Islamic State? And, and secondly, you know, just how quickly will Donald Trump move to embrace and improve relations with Moscow. You know, you combine it uh, with these new protective, protective uh, trade measures and you begin to really get the sense that America is moving in an entirely new direction. OK, Robert Moore in Washington, thank you. Here, an inquest has heard about the final moments of three British holidaymakers who were shot dead in a terrorist attack in Tunisia. One witness told the hearing the victims didn't stand a chance as an Islamic State-inspired gunman opened fire. They included a couple from Surrey who died side by side, as Garrett Vincent reports. John and Janet Stocker's children say they were a happy couple who loved each other and loved life. They died on the last day of their holiday. The inquest was shown a computer reconstruction of the resort and where each of the victims were killed. The court was told the stockers didn't stand a chance. They were the first to be shot. The gunman walked from the beach and into the grounds of the hotel. At the height of the holiday season, he had no shortage of targets. 
The inquest heard statements from friends that the victims had made while they were staying at the resort. They described the holiday routine on the morning of the attack, picking out sunbeds and buying drinks from the bar. Then everything changes. Suddenly bullets are strafing the sand and a man is walking up the beach firing an automatic rifle. One witness remembered the gunman standing over one of his victims and firing a single shot. It was, he said, like an execution. Trudy Jones, a grandmother from South Wales, was also killed on the beach. She was on holiday with her friend Carol, who described recognising her body in the mortuary by the glittery nail varnish on her toes. Another witness, Mark Hornby, gave evidence about booking his holiday with the tour operator Thompson. I did not check the Foreign Office website as I was not aware of it, he said. The terror risk was not brought to our attention by Thompson. I assumed we would be safe on our holiday, especially as the hotel was five stars. The inquest is dealing with the details of each of the British victims in turn. It has started with those who were shot on their sunbeds in the middle of their holiday. Geraint Vincent, ITV News. At least 10 shots were fired when a policeman was injured in a shooting at a Belfast petrol station last night. The community officer is stable in hospital after suffering two bullet wounds to the arm. Dissident Republicans are believed to be responsible. And Michelle O'Neill is to replace Martin McGuinness as leader of Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland. Mr McGuinness resigned as Deputy First Minister earlier this month. He is not seeking re-election because he is battling a serious illness. Now, rescuers at an Italian hotel which was buried by an avalanche say they still hope to find survivors five days on. Eleven people have so far been pulled out alive, including four children. And spirits have been raised a little further by the remarkable escape of three puppies, as Richard Pallo reports. In freezing temperatures, five days on, still they hope. For now, it remains too precarious to bring in any heavy machinery. The search is being done by hand. Every hour, the chance lessens of finding any of the 23 people still missing. Through a gap only inches wider than his body, a rescue worker squeezes through the hotel's roof. 60,000 tonnes of fallen snow and rock has made the structure impenetrable in parts. Prosecutors are investigating if the hotel could have been evacuated before the avalanche and whether authorities ignored an email from the hotel's owner saying it wasn't safe for the guests. Those who died have been killed, says the father of one missing man. They were kidnapped against their will because they wanted to leave. Those who made it out are making good recoveries. Most are already home, like 22-year-old Georgia Galassi, who ate ice and snow to survive. It's been two days since any human rescue. Today, three puppies emerged, looking remarkably unscathed. The six-week-old Abruzzo Shepherd dogs had sheltered in the boiler room, giving everyone belief that someone else might just be discovered. Richard Palo, ITV News. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, how do you like your toast? New government advice on how brown it should be and... Milton Keynes is a tiny village in the heart of North Buckinghamshire. From concrete cows to a city of roundabouts, Milton Keynes turns 50. Those stories and more after the break. Join me then. Welcome back. Now, there was a fresh warning today that roasting, frying and grilling certain foods could heighten your risk of getting cancer. The Food Standards Agency says that chips, crisps and even toast can have high levels of acrylamide. Now, experts say that could cause serious disease and have launched a campaign to help people reduce the risk. As Martha Fairley reports. Bad news if you prefer your toast well done, because the Food Standards Agency's warning it could be linked to cancer. At this cafe, they cater for all tastes. I've been eating burnt toast all my life, so it's not going to make any difference now. I, I don't mind it well cooked here. Sometimes quite crispy. 
Acrylamide is a probable carcinogen that's created when starchy food, such as potatoes, root vegetables, bread, are cooked at high temperature. So this FSA video is advising we should avoid dark brown or burnt toast, chips, roast potatoes, and even some cereals and coffee, which all contain a substance called acrylamide that could cause cancer. The odd slice of toast or potato which is burnt is not going to be a major issue. We're talking about during your lifetime here of constant exposure. But what we would say is that you're somebody who burned your toast every single day. That would not be sensible. Scientists say frying your chips until they're crispy and brown may increase average dietary exposure by up to 80%. Toasting bread for five minutes instead of three can increase acrylamide content by nearly four times. But that's still not much. Eating the toast only increases average dietary exposure by nearly two and a half percent. The advice is being criticised as a recipe for confusion. I think there's two concerns. One is that the worried well will get even more obsessive. And the other is that people will become generally sceptical about, oh, scientists now saying you shouldn't do X, Y and Z. Whereas in fact, of course, our diet is important. Acrylamide has been known about for years and people have been trying for years to measure its association and they haven't found that. So I think the one thing we can say that even if there is some increased risk is not important. While a link between acrylamide and cancer has been found in mice, with humans it's still inconclusive. The FSA say they're just trying to be as safe and cautious as possible. Martha Fairley, ITV News. And to find out more about the guidance from the Food Standards Agency, go to our website, itv.com slash news. Now, London has issued its first very high toxic air alert. The pollution warnings are for the rest of today and tomorrow. People with respiratory conditions are being advised to take extra care. Samsung has confirmed faults with the batteries of its Galaxy Note 7 caused the handsets to catch fire. The problems forced it to scrap the flagship model in October, just months after its launch. And the boxer Nicola Adams is leaving the Great Britain squad to become professional. The Olympic champion will make her professional debut in April in Manchester. Tributes have been paid to Gordon Kay, the actor best known for playing René in the sitcom Allo Allo, who's died aged 75. His co-star Vicky Michelle, who played waitress Yvette in the series, told ITV News that he was loved the world over. Our arts editor Nina Nana looks back on his career. You are probably wondering what I am doing in the larder of my cafe, sitting next to the brie. Well, I will tell you, I am very fond of brie. <laughs> he would begin with his customary monologue. For ten years, with audiences of around 17 million an episode, Gordon Kay as cafe owner René Artois would bring us the ridiculous goings-on in his corner of occupied France. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Michelle Dubois. Time is very short. Listen very carefully. I shall say this only once. I beg your pardon. Clear. Did anybody see you leave the bar? No. Good. <gasps> oh. For the actress who played Yvette Carte Blanche opposite his René, Kay was a comic genius. He made people laugh out loud. He was in a series that was so popular and he'll be remembered forever through new generations. And that is an amazing, amazing tribute to a, a fantastic actor. It was in Coronation Street in 1969 where Gordon Kay rose to prominence, playing Elsie Tanner's nephew. But not even a serious head injury suffered whilst driving in a storm in 1990 could prevent Gordon Kay from returning to the role that made his name. Hello, hello, this is Nighthawk, receiving you loud and crackly. <laughs> it was of its time, deliberately silly, but in his hands, René became unforgettable, a classic comic creation. Yankton Gordon Kay, whose death was announced today. Britain's Joanna Conta is through to the quarterfinals of the Australian Open and a showdown with Serena Williams. It follows another impressive performance from the British number one who claimed victory over Russia's Ekaterina Makarova. 
And finally tonight, for 50 years, Milton Keynes has been much maligned and joked about. But as it celebrates its half century, could the new town be having the last laugh? Its grid design is now hailed as visionary and its shopping centre has been listed. And as Ben Chapman reports from the town, even its most controversial features are considered art. Its detractors said the place was so artificial, even the cows had to be made out of concrete. But it's just one of many myths. Milton Keynes is a tiny village in the heart of North Buckinghamshire. Take the name, not, as many believe, a construct, but the village that 50 years ago was told to expect a quarter of a million newcomers. Londoners down here, we, we just don't like them. She was talking about people like Peter Barry and his family who moved to one of the very first streets. Number 14 was used for the school because the school was still under construction. So what children there were used to go there. It was a bit of an adventure, you know, you felt like the pioneers of the Old West. It was a pioneering place, planned on a grid to allow easy expansion. Designed for the age of the car, its many derided roundabouts eliminated traffic jams. A town that rejected a traditional high street in favour of a shopping centre half a mile long. Rumour has it people would race minis through here at night. Throughout the 80s, it was marketed as a sort of urban paradise. Wouldn't it be nice if all cities were like Milton Keynes? The man who brought league football here says everyone came with a dream. People have talked about a can-do attitude. Well, I think the stadium is a great example of can-do. You know, maybe you shouldn't have. That's another argument altogether. But in Milton Keynes, if you can believe it, if you can dream it, you can do it. The latest dream is driverless cars, with developers among 11,000 businesses here. Original residents Rebecca Rich and her mum tell me they're proud to be from here. I've travelled quite a lot and often had to listen to people say, oh, isn't that all roundabouts and concrete cows? <laughs> and I've been able to tell people no. Love or loathe its layout, what began as a planner's dream is now a model exported round the world. Not bad for a new town that's still in middle age. Ben Chapman, ITV News, Milton Keynes. And that is all for now. Tom Bradby will be live from Washington with News at 10. But from me and all the team here in London, have a great evening. Bye-bye.